Hello and welcome to episode 32 of The Witcher, chapter by chapter book review, where I'll go through a summary of what happened in the latest chapter and give my detailed thoughts on it. Today I'm discussing chapter 4 from Baptism of Fire. Okay, trying to give myself more energy in whatever way I can because right before I started recording, I ate a meal and I made brownies and I wanted to try one of those brownies. So I ate one for dessert. I made them for the weekend though, because I try not to eat things like brownies throughout the week. You know, the week's five days, the weekend is two days. So I figure, okay, two days a week, if I'm not eating super healthy, it's not that big of a deal. But I wanted to try them. I'm recording this on a Friday, by the way. But I wanted to try them, so I ate one, and it was so good (laughs) that I had to have another one. So I had a meal, and then I had two thick brownies. And yeah, they were so delicious, but now I'm really full. And I feel like I could take a nap right now, (laughs) but uh, I'm gonna try to push my way through this, you know, as far as my energy goes, my energy levels, and then maybe take a nap afterwards or just do something relaxing because (laughs) I'm so sleepy right now. But I'm excited to talk about The Witcher, but this is another one, and I'm sorry that I keep saying this. I mean, I don't think I said this last time, but I feel like I've said it a handful of times within the past like five episodes that this is going to be a short one. I know it's going to be short. It's just, it's not a lot happens. If you're reading along, you know, you understand, I'm sure. Uh, It's, I mean, there is stuff that takes place, but it's not really, not a lot of eventful things. And then the one thing that, like the most eventful thing that does happen We're going to talk about that in detail, of course, but it's just, there's not a lot to cover. So (laughs) let's get into it then, I guess. So here comes the recap of last episode, uh, right before I give you the summary of this chapter. So last chapter, during their travels, the gang finds Cahir's riderless horse and comes to the conclusion the knight has met his end. Later, they stumble upon a friendly and intelligent barber surgeon called Regis, who invites them to his summer residence where they drink mandrake moonshine and agree to have him join them on their journey. All right, well, here is a summary of chapter four. The chapter starts out with Geralt, Milva, Dandelion, Zoltan, and Percival recovering from the moonshine. They set off and come across a group of peasants who demand that Milva give them her horse so they can use it to search for a vampire. Tensions build, but she refuses, and she retaliates to an insult by punching the rude peasant and almost killing him. They continue on until they reach a refugee camp, and the women and children they've been escorting are reunited with their family. While looking for food for themselves and the horses in the camp, the group of peasants from earlier approach them, now demanding they give them their horses as payment for the one Milva socked, since he's now mentally unstable and therefore cannot go through with his upcoming wedding. They agree to settle matters with the camp elder, who at the moment is sitting in judgment of a young, mentally challenged girl accused of witchery and colluding with a vampire. Since it's obvious she's innocent, the group steps in in her defense. The priest accusing her agrees that her innocence can be proven if someone can remove a horseshoe from burning coals and bring it to him without burning their hands. Regis volunteers and somehow performs the task exactly as instructed. Before the trial can go any further, Nilfgaardian cavalry storm the camp, pursued by a Temerian unit. Geralt, trying to save Dandelion, who got swept up and knocked over in the pandemonium, gets knocked unconscious by horse hooves. When he comes to, he and Dandelion are immediately accused by Temerian soldiers of either being Nilfgaardian spies or army deserters. They're brought to their superior, Daniel Echevery, a count who knows and is fond of Dandelion. They're about to be granted freedom when Marshal Visigurd of Sintra steps in and recognizes Geralt from his involvement in Pavetta and Dooney's marriage 15 years ago. Since Visigurd has a very bitter memory of this, Geralt and Dandelion, probably Dandelion, are going to be executed. Another bad ending to a chapter. All right, well, uh, one of the first things I wanted to point out was there was there was a lot of talk about vampires in this chapter. So at the beginning, the peasants were truly under the belief that there were vampires nearby this camp, and they killed a couple of people. So there were two people that ended up dead, and they 
thought that it was a vampire and they wanted to use Milva's horse because they say that if you ride a black horse through a graveyard, the horse will stop at the grave where the vampire is buried. And Geralt doesn't completely refute this, but he doesn't really seem to be on board with this theory. I don't think that he's heard of this before and he seems a little bit dismissive of it. So that was the first mention. And then later when they have that girl on trial for being a witch, they're also accusing her of colluding with a vampire. So it's just interesting that vampires came up multiple times throughout this chapter. We didn't actually see any. And I'm pretty sure if I am remembering correctly, the last time we have seen a vampire, the first and the last time we saw a vampire in the Witcher story was back in the very second chapter, second short story from the last Wish book, which was the first book of the series, where it was uh, the guy Nivellen, uh, Geralt goes to his house and he's got that lover who was a Bruxa, a form of higher vampire, and he kills her. And it was a very difficult fight. So we don't really know that much about vampires, but we learn, I guess, a little bit more in this chapter. Regis had a lot of knowledge of them. But yeah, a lot of talk about vampires, which I thought was was interesting considering that you didn't really even see any. So <laughs> moving on, let's talk about Regis. <laughs> so not really a whole lot to say about him, except it's just pretty crazy that he was able to do what he did with the horseshoe. No explanation. He picks this horseshoe up that's definitely way too hot for anybody to handle. Zoltan was actually going to step in and do it because he, th- I guess he considered the, the, the fact that his hands were probably rough enough that maybe they would be able to tolerate the burning horseshoe, but I don't think he would have been successful. I think that he was just hoping to do it so that they could save this poor girl, but uh, no, Ray just stepped in and he did it and he was holding in his hand and he put it in his other hand and he's still holding it just to show the hand that was originally holding it was fine, no signs of burn marks. It, there's no explanation. I can't think of <laughs> why that would be possible, but there's uh, there's obviously something going on there with Regis. And we don't know him very well. We met him only in the last chapter. So far, he seems very nice. He's very intelligent. He's got a lot of knowledge of pretty obscure things, but Nothing that we have found out about him so far would indicate that he is able to do something like that. Like, that's a inhuman or superhuman ability. That's something that nobody should be able to do unless you're maybe a sorcerer. But, yeah, he he did it. He accomplished the task, and it didn't matter anyway because that's when Nilfgaard showed up right away. So that's also why we don't get an explanation as to how he could <laughs> manage to do that without burning himself. So I hope we get to see him again. I hope that he was okay with everything that happened with the Nilfgaardian unit showing up and just you know, start trying to slaughter these innocent refugees in a camp. Uh, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens with Regis. And uh, I want him to come back because he's a likable character, but also I want some answers on that. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to what I would consider the main event of this chapter. Uh, which is the part where Geralt and Dandelion are captured and then brought to the the, um, the army camp, and then Visigurd shows up. So just to provide some more color to what happened there, because I kind of glossed over it a little bit in the summary. So there were Temerian soldiers who fought off those Nilfgaardians that showed up, and they bring Geralt and Dandelion to their camp because they think that they're either army deserters or spies. So their superior, this guy, Daniel Echeverry, he's full test liaison officer, and he knows Dandelion. He likes him a lot. So he explains to Geralt and Dandelion that the people below him that captured those two, they think everybody is a spy. Like, they see spies everywhere they go. And he said that every time they're sent out, they come back with people who they're, they're accusing of being spies. And most of the time, that's not the case. But I think maybe when you're losing a war, that's probably not going to be an uncommon thing. Or it's not really surprising that they would think that way. But everything seems to be going well. It wasn't good for a while there when the when Geralt and Dandelion got captured. But it seems to be getting better. Like, okay, this guy knows Dandelion. This is going to work out. He invites them to dinner. But that's where it goes wrong. So Dandelion's about to accept the dinner invitation. Geralt just wants to get out of there. He's like, uh, I don't know. I, I would rather just go. He's about to decline. And that's when Visigurd shows up. So we already knew by this time that Sintra 
there were Sintran soldiers there because they noticed the Sintran emblem. And this is what made Geralt want to get away. Also, I think it just probably wasn't a good situation for them to stick around in longer than they had to. But this guy, Marshall Visigard, he has a problem with basically Pavetta and Dooney's marriage. I mean, they're dead now anyway, but he had a problem with it at the time. So this is basically why he didn't like Geralt, because Geralt assisted with that, like that was able to happen with his help. And Visigurd was present at that ball where Geralt helped helped to lift the curse from Dooney back in the story, A Question of Price. Something interesting about this or something that I would like to know what your thoughts are if you read this recently, because when I read this, the, I remember the very first time that I read this chapter, I remember thinking, who the hell is Visigurd? When they talked about him, I was like, oh, okay, this is just some new character. Although they do mention him in, I think it was chapter five or six in Blood of Elves. Uh, there's that chapter where the northern leaders like Foltest and Vizimir and Meave and a couple others are discussing politics and their strategy to deal with Nilfgaard. And they talk about Visigurd a couple of times. But when it comes to the question of price story, I remember thinking, who the hell is this guy? I don't ever remember that name. And some of the names that came to mind, there was this guy at the ball at the feast. His name was Rainfarn. He had a huge problem. There was Croc on Crate of Skellige. He also had a really big problem with Dooney and with him trying to take Pavetta. But I never even remembered anybody in that story called Visigurd. So I actually went back and I skimmed through the entire chapter looking for the name Visigurd. He is in there, so... It's not like they just decided later that they were going to add this guy. He was present. However, he maybe has two lines. I know he has at least one. So after Pavetta sends everybody flying through the room, all the furniture goes everywhere because she explodes with this magical force that she has no control over. I think it was Visigurd who goes, what the hell was that? I think that's the only thing you actually see him say. And he was talking to, like, whispering to Calanthe at one point. That's it. Like, there was nothing that really indicated that he had an issue with Dooney. That he had an issue with Geralt helping Dooney and Pavetta come together the way that he did. Nothing indicated that. And I'm saying that with the utmost confidence because the first time I read this through, I thought, okay, maybe I just forgot because he was such a minor character but no he really <laughs> didn't express that but that's why and I'm not trying to be I mean I guess I am being very pedantic here but it's just and it's not I don't have a big issue with it is what I'm trying to say like I'm not upset that it was inconsistent or anything I just think it's interesting that Geralt knew when as soon as he saw Visigur, as soon as Visigur showed up he holds out his hands to be bound again how did Geralt know that Visigurd was going to have an issue with him over everything? And it might also have a little bit to do with him claiming Ciri. And I guess it wasn't, it was, it's public knowledge at this point that Geralt did take Ciri. But it's still just, I, I, how did he know that Visigurd would have an issue with that? I don't know. There might be something that I'm missing. I mean, there's, I know that there's nothing missing, at least from the A Question of Price story, but there might be another reason that I just can't think of as to why Geralt knew Visigurd was going to have a problem with him. I, I, I found it quite odd, but I could just be missing something. So let me know if you know why Visigurd had an issue with him. I mean, aside from what's explained in this chapter, if you understand why Geralt was already prepared when he saw Visigurd to have to deal with Visigurd's issue, let me know because I can't figure it out. But either way, it's for the most part, it's neither here nor there because he does have the issue and it might lead to Geralt's execution. We'll, we'll have to see how that goes exactly. But it's not looking good. But Visigurd is claiming in this chapter that Geralt agreed to help Dooney in advance for the promise of claiming the Law of Surprise. That's obviously not true. But he also claims that Geralt kidnapped Ciri hid her, and then sold her to a mirror. And because he was found among Nilf this Nilfgaardian raid the, at this camp, he must be a spy. 
which I guess that doesn't look too good. If he thinks that Geralt sold Ciri to Amir, then it would be, um, it, it wouldn't look good to find him amongst Nilf guardians. But, I mean, that's the explanation we get after Geralt already knew that Visigur was going to have a problem with him, so that doesn't really explain how Geralt already knew that. But either way, um, Dandelion goes ahead and he denies this. Geralt kind of just sits there quietly and doesn't say anything, but Dandelion, you know, he talks a lot. He's got kind of a big mouth. We love him, but he's got a big mouth. So he denies this, and his contradiction just falls on deaf ears. And he also says that, uh, Dandelion also says that Ciri has a right to the throne of Sintra, and this triggers Visigur. Like, this is something he doesn't like to hear because he, he comes up with this argument that Ciri has no right to the throne because her great-grandmother, Dahlia, slept with her cousin and her great-great-grandmother slept with everybody. So it's kind of similar to what Codringer and Fenn's original plan was when Geralt went to them for help asking them to make it so that the trident to do whatever they could to get the northern leaders to leave Ciri alone and hopefully Nilfgaard also. Uh, it's not the exact same plan, but basically by trying to make it seem like Ciri has no claim to the throne, that it, whoever's hands sh she falls in, it, it, w it wouldn't be like a legitimate thing. But I mean, his his tactic is a little bit different and not really as strong as what Codringer and Fen were going for. But he's hoping that what he can do by saying that is that Emir will be placing Ciri on the Sintran throne at some point or by or be trying to claim Sintra as, because Ciri has a right to Sintra and he's supposed to marry her. I think he's hoping to spread this rumor. It's kind of, it seems like it's kind of far-fetched or like it like there's not really a good chance that this is going to work and I'm, he probably knows that too, but I think he's a little bit desperate at this point. But I think that he's hoping that nobody will accept it because if, if they were actually able to get Siri, like if Visigurd and the rest of the people from Sintra were able to get a hold of Siri before Amir did, I don't think they would be saying these things. <laughs> well, they definitely wouldn't. They would be using her to retake Sintra from Nilfgaard. And then it would be you know, back in the hands of the Northerners. It wouldn't be a Nilfgaardian thing anymore. But they're just trying to do whatever they can to make it so that Sintra doesn't belong to Nilfgaard. But it's just not, I don't think that that's going to work. It's a weak strategy. But anyway, Dandelion, and when Visigurd makes this argument about Ciri's legitimacy to the throne, Dandelion warns him not to speak so poorly of Ciri and her lineage within earshot of his Sintran troops because they might they might not remain loyal to him if they hear him saying that stuff. And if he wasn't triggered before, he's definitely triggered now. This really sets him off. He punches Dandelion in the face a couple of times. Uh, luckily, he's called out of the room before he can go any further because I don't know when he would have stopped. But... He is triggered by this so severely, and Daniel Echevery explains this, it's because apparently a lot of his soldiers already deserted him after the news of Amir having Siri broke out. So the soldiers were originally motivated to fight for Sintra and take it back from Nilfgaard, but when they found out that she sought asylum in Nilfgaard, they didn't feel like they had anything to fight for anymore. So it's, it felt kind of like a lost cause. It felt pretty hopeless. Like, they're not going to get Sintra back. It's just going to be Nilfgaard, and it's going to be solidified with Ciri marrying Amir. So if more of his men desert him, he's going to lose his position. And that's why, that's another reason why he's creating all these rumors about Ciri and her not having this legitimate claim to the throne. So a nice guy. <laughs> nice guy, this visitor. Well, that's pretty much all of the details that I wanted to explain uh, with the most eventful part of the chapter. So not really much else to say there before I go into my closing thoughts. So I think I'll just jump into that. So one thing I actually left this out of the summary was Siri had a prophetic dream about Geralt. So that's interesting. I don't know what can be done about that, but these dreams are happening both ways now. I would like to think that maybe they can somehow use that to their advantage to become reunited, but I don't know if Ciri's actually even looking for him. We haven't really seen what she has been doing since she joined the rats. We saw her riding through a village with them. 
we saw her dancing in a barn and then she woke up from this prophetic dream in a cave but no more specifics past that it's been very vague very it's just, it's just been left alone since she joined them at the end of the time of contempt so i'm hoping that maybe that she's dreaming about Geralt she'll start to find him or She'll start to look for him again uh, and hope to be reunited with him. I don't know if she has told the rats about who he is or that she needs she needs help finding somebody because I don't, I don't know that she would need to tell them who he is, but she doesn't, they don't know who she is. Like, they don't know that she's Siri, that she's this princess. They know her as Falca. So I don't think, we don't know for sure yet, but I don't think that Siri has told the rats that she has uh, this basically father-like figure and mother that she wants to get back to. And I don't think that she's actually searching, but we don't know that for sure. But I'm hoping that maybe because she had this dream, she's going to start to look for Geralt and also maybe Yennefer again too. But yeah, just very little perspective on what's happened with her. So I don't know. We're just going to, it's another thing. We're just going to have to wait and see. But as far as the ending to this chapter goes with, Geralt and Dandelion being uh, close to execution. I can't imagine that with the remainder of this book, plus two more books, that's going to actually take place. I mean, it's obviously a sticky situation and it kind of sucks, but I don't think that it's going to happen. It would be pretty odd. Like, I don't know how they could <laughs> continue the story that much further without them, but they could pull some Game of Thrones shit and kill off main characters. So we're going to have to wait and see. Hopefully it's in the next chapter. And they don't make us wait because the next chapter could just focus around another character. We've seen that happen with others before where it's left off on this big cliffhanger and then they don't even explain what happens the following chapter. you got to wait two or even three chapters sometimes. So hopefully we figure out what happens and if he does escape, how he escapes. Hopefully that's next chapter. But that's for next episode to discuss. <laughs> I just don't un understand or I just don't, I can't imagine how he could get out of that except for the fact that um, Zoltan, Percival, uh, Milva, and Regis are, they, they might be okay. Like they might've gotten out of that. Hopefully they're okay. We don't get to see what happens with them. So for all we know, they got killed in the slaughter, but I don't know, maybe one of them or all of them made it out and they're going to try to rescue Geralt and Dandelion. I imagine that would be very difficult because they're in this army camp. I don't think an army camp is a place you could easily sneak in and then sneak somebody out of. But uh, something, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure will have to be done to free them. Or maybe Visigurd will get killed or something. I don't know. We'll have to wait and find out. But um, um, yeah, I'm really curious to see what happened to the rest of the group. Because when the chaos erupted with Nilfgaardian storming the camp, uh, Zoltan and Percival <laughs> and the camp elder, this guy, his name is Elder Labs, they are taking one of those hot horseshoes and sticking it down the robe of the priest that was trying the that poor girl so all of this stuff is going on and then their priority is to get back at this priest <laughs> it was really funny but it's just it kind of gives you an idea as to how tough they are and that ma that makes me feel a little bit better that they at least might have made it out but yeah we'll wait and see until next chapter but you know what so far i know that i said i think it was the first episode where i started to cover baptism of fire the chapter one episode that a lot of people seem to not have that high of an opinion of this book uh, compared to the others i mean obviously they like it they like the witcher they like this book but out of all of them they don't like this one that much i can kind of see where they're coming from now that we're three chapters in because it is slow moving but I'm really enjoying it still, even though not that much progress has been made since the first chapter when Geralt is, he's leaving um, Broccolon Forest and Milva is trying to catch up with him and then she catches up with him. But yeah, it doesn't seem like that much has really happened since then. Like not a lot of eventful things. We still don't know what's happened to Yennefer, but I think it's just, even with that, even though we haven't really gotten that far from where we were once Time of Contempt ended, I still think that the, the characters, I think, is what does it. The characters are so likable. 
like we, we you know we've known Geralt and Dandelion for a while obviously we love them but Milva and Zoltan Percival and now Regis they're so likable they're just such an it's just such a pleasure to read about them so I think that that helps to make the slow progress at the beginning of this book a, a lot more enjoyable to read anyway uh yeah I think that's all I have for you uh so yeah this wasn't super short I've gone way shorter <laughs> before but I'm pretty sure the next chapter is going to give me a lot more to talk about so you can expect a longer episode next week or I mean sorry depending on when you're listening to this um the, <laughs> the next episode anyway you can expect it to be longer all right well, just to let you know, these episodes are available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining, and I will catch you all in the next episode.